Hey there guys and welcome to my um, 6,000 subscriber Q&A uh, video. Um, so I'm finally at that point where I've hit 6,000 subscribers so I opened up um, uh, opened up myself to your guys' questions so I can go ahead and answer anything you're curious about or anything like that. Um, I just want to kind of say, you know, thank you guys so much. It's been so amazing, you know, being at 6,000 subscribers already and, um, uh, getting to meet everybody. Well, not meet, but you know what I mean. Um, sort of, uh, kind of get to know everybody and, uh, you know, get all of your nice comments and hear all of you guys' nice feedback. It's just been really, really awesome. It's been nothing but a positive experience um, since I joined YouTube. And I know I've said this before, but I was a little bit afraid to even do it because I had heard the horror stories about uh, uh, how people are mean and things like that. But so far, everybody's been really, really nice. And I've, you know, nothing but enjoyed my time on YouTube. Um, so I went ahead and I took up a collection of questions and things like that and I'm just going to kind of go into it um, since there's so many of them and uh, the I also opened up a poll to find out what it was you guys would like to see me draw as I'm answering these questions and funny enough um, Pips Ren, uh, Piper and Liz Rain won out above pretty much everything by quite a bit. Um, I didn't think that the pairing was that popular. Um, but I guess it is. Um, they're very cute together, so I, I understand it. It's my favorite ship, so there you go. Um, so I'm going to be doodling a little bit of Piper and Liss Rain uh, as I'm uh, answering these questions. So you guys can kind of see me sketch and things like that. But yeah, so I'm going to go ahead and get right into it since, like I said, there's quite a few questions. You'll have to excuse me. I'm going to be drinking a little bit while I'm doing this. Um, it's very hot. This is the third time I've tried to record this. My camera's finally acting right again. I don't know what it is about the heat and humidity, but my camera just was not having it. So I gave it a break. I charged the battery. I cleared off a ton of room and I just kind of let it um, rest um, every now and then. I, I, I treat my electronics like people. It's like eh, maybe they're just crabby and, and need a break. It usually works. Um, <laughs> uh, so yeah, it's acting right today, so yeah. I'm going to go ahead and get right into it as soon as I wet my whistle here a little bit. Oh, yeah, just so hot today. Okay, so my first question comes from Logaraki over on Instagram, and they ask, what sketchbook do you recommend? I have gone over this a couple times already, but I'll go ahead and do it just for the Q&A. Um, I use several different kinds of sketchbooks depending on my mood, depending on what I'm drawing, depending on how, I far, how far I want to go with a drawing. So I don't just use one sketchbook and I highly encourage you guys to have more than one sketchbook as well. Um, some sketchbooks are going to be good for your color mediums, others are going to be good just for sketching. Um, but since it is a sketchbook that she's, they, I don't know if it's he or she, are asking about, um, I would just go with what I am sketching with right now, which is my pro art sketchbook. It's just kind of um, regular sketch paper. I don't know what the poundage is on it. Do do do. I'm sure I can find out here real quick. Oh, well, it's 50 pound, so it's not like um, drawing paper, which can hold heavier dry mediums like charcoal and um, pastels and things like that. It's just for graphite and doodling. So you know, you don't have to get top of the line paper for, I mean, I know plenty of people who just use regular printer paper for, um, their sketching, but you know, for obviously for marker work, I still encourage the, um, uh, Canson mixed medium, mixed midi, yeah, mixed medium papers and, um, the hammer hill, hammer mill, whatever it is. Uh, color copy, digital color copy, and the higher poundages. You, it, uh, the thing with poundages is, is you have to look at that. Um, the higher the poundage, the more abuse basically the paper can take. The smaller the poundage, the thinner it is, the easier your mediums can go through and be seen on the other side. So I tend to find that um, with my inking, I always have to have something, um, or I prefer to have something that's 70 
70 pound and higher for inking um, this stuff right here ink would just go straight through even like the non bleed through markers will bleed through this stuff but yeah that's what I recommend uh, Lopa pan I think it's Lopa pancake something like that uh, on Instagram asks out of all of my characters who is my favorite I like all of my characters for one reason or another they're all de they're all designed they're all created for a purpose um, they all have characteristics that either I admire or that um I wish I had myself so I don't just like one character or another I have an easier time with certain characters especially the ones I've already gotten hammered down through uh, writing and things like that so Piper is one of my favorite to draw because I know her I know the expressions I can put on her I know the story behind her so she tends to be favored Cherry is a very close second um, because I've got so much work done on her already um, in the other characters, uh, Adam and, uh, um, oh, I know I've got other characters, <laughs> Scarlet and, and people like that, um, there would be more artwork of them if I understood the character a little bit better, but it's a very slow process because I like to roleplay out my character development and finding people to roleplay out my characters with is highly difficult. Um, I can't find anyone to commit to actually doing it for more than a couple months. Uh, so I kind of get stagnant there, but um, yeah, that's that's basically it. I don't have a favorite character. I like all of my characters. They is all my babies. Okay, so the next question is from Nightmare Bunny 3 on Instagram. Has Cherry always been rambunctious, or has something happened to where she acts that way? That depends on the timeline she's coming from. Um, the timeline that she m people are most familiar with when it comes to her she yes when she was created um she was always intended to be sort of a rambunctious child um her history shows it she's always kind of uh been a scrapper always kind of had an attitude about her but she is also highly the product of her environment which is very true of people across the board if you grow up in an environment of poverty and of crime and things like that, those sorts of things kind of become more acceptable. Um, initially, when it came to Harp and Stars and everything, she was growing up um, very involved with uh, the Dallahans, which is a gang. And to her, that was her family. To her, that was her life. That's That was her aspirations, was to be, become part of the Dallahans and things like that. And there are really only two major things that she could do within that organization and one was thieving which she was doing and it wasn't very profitable and the other one was prostitution which was very profitable and she was taken care of so in that instance events happened that cascaded and sent her on a specific path she sort of how do you say without going into too much detail because obviously I'm not even sure that that's going to be part of her history anymore um there was an event that happened that she got her way with and it sort of put her on this pathway of very strong manipulation and um sort of this inhibition towards others but that's not to say that that's how she is overall she still very much cares for her friends and her family she's not an evil person she just is learning how to work the system and you know she's figuring it out and yeah so you know there's two ways she handles things and that's either with her fists or with her body and she figures it out and once you figure it out that's just kind of what you go with again product of her environment and a little bit of just how she is all right so on the next thing. um shmangelina over on youtube asks why does my butt tingle well honey go see a doctor about that um that obviously wasn't meant to be a real question. Uh, all time favorite piece of art. I really don't have one because that changes as my skill improves. It changes as my skill changes and my art style changes. Um, I don't limit myself to just one art style. I try to kind of cross the gamut with all sorts of different kinds of styles. I like to be able to pick and choose what I do. I don't like being held to one uh, type of drawing or way of drawing. And I feel like that's been very beneficial to me because um, it's allowed me to enter different 
aspects of my own creative process that normally would have been very close to me if I had just stuck with one type of art. So I don't have a favorite piece. I just have, um, yeah, I don't really have a favorite piece. In a nutshell, I don't have one. Um, if I had to pick one like right at this very moment, it would probably be my watercolor works because I'm proud of how I've developed in that medium. Um, whereas before I was just kind of a mess. What do you struggle with most in your art? Oh, definitely, um, definitely getting concepts across. I don't feel like I'm very strong in that. And anatomy is something I struggle greatly with, as, as you guys can see. Um, I don't always plan out bodies and where they're going to be placed. So when I go to draw the actual bodies, I don't have like the, the skeleton. I don't have the whole figure or the whole gesture drawn out. So I kind of wing it and it leads to some pretty um, special anatomy. And because of that, I've tried to slow down and make myself focus more on doing that, but I get very impatient. So I'm like, well, it's just gonna be bad anatomy. There's no helping it. And I also struggle with my male characters because I've, I'm have i so used to drawing women um, that male characters elude me. I don't write them very well. I don't, <laughs> I don't draw them very well. They all just kind of tend to have very feminine uh, appearances and that kind of drives me up the wall because I don't I don't want to always do that so it's something I'm working on definitely and she also asks can I touch your bees well you can try I don't think they'll like it though they might sting you um my wonderful nightmare over on Instagram asks what is your biggest inspiration for your characters such as people you've met personalities you've encountered or just um, from different media around you? Well, the short answer to that is, is I get um, most of my inspiration from my friends. I like collaborating. I like uh, tossing ideas around with people, you know, people that'll listen. I don't like trying to toss people around, tossing ideas around with people who are just waiting for me to stop talking so they can talk. Um, and you can definitely tell when that's how they are. That's how they be. Um, so I don't, I usually get most of my inspiration from that. If I can find people who do that, it's like fantastic. But I've also found that those kinds of people tend to get very wishy-washy and then they don't stick around very long, which is really sad because in that moment, it's such a high finding somebody to uh, compare and develop with and then they're gone. So it's it's a it's a double-edged sword it's it's very sad sometimes but it's also very awesome at other times um as far as characters um how i develop them like i said before it's basically just personality traits i wish i had in myself or that i admire so it can be from people around me but usually i just kind of sit down and i'm like okay what do i want this character's key trait to be and then i figure that out and that's it. I, I tend to develop my characters around a trait. Like Piper is developed around total naivete. Um, there's other things like innocence in there and just unwavering ability to love. But um, yeah, you know that's that's basically it. And then I go from there. Like I said, if I can find somebody to work on her story with, then it's all the better for me and hopefully for them. I hope I contribute to them as well. Media wise, I'm not too inspired because I'm very disappointed with uh, comics and um, cartoons that I see these days. They're not very good and the writing's not very good. So I'm just like, okay, I'm, I'm, this is not inspirational to me at all. But yeah. So um, Candace Foy on Instagram asks, do you have a favorite medium? If you had to do one, if you do, Oh my goodness, if you do, if not, okay, there we go. If not, do you have one that you like more than the others? Um, my favorite medium is what you guys are seeing right now, um, graphite. I love sketching, I love doodling, because they're, they're not set in stone. It's not a waste of a material for me to sketch something out real quick, and if I decide I don't like it, okay, I'm out like a little bit of pencil lead. It's not, you know, a nice ink, it's not, you know, Copic marker or anything like that. So I do favor graphite very much more and I'm more experienced with it and I understand that you can clean it up and you can actually make your graphite sketches and your pencil sketches look like inks and things like that if you know what you're doing. 
So yes, I do prefer graphite over most everything. It's also what I've worked the most with in my life, so. Okay, so the JMI Creations has quite a few questions here. So um, he asks, what do you plan to do with all of your characters um, and the in-depth stories that you have written with them? Put so much effort into them, so I wanted to know what you are going to do with them. Um, if you will publish the story, publish a story or something like that. I'm not a writer, and that's just the crux of it. I don't write. Um, I am terrible at it. I cannot make myself do it. I sit down and say, "Okay, we're going to write something out today," and I'm like mm, the entire time. I'd rather talk it out, role play it out, draw it out. Um, but ultimately, what I'm aiming for is a graphic novel of some kind. Uh, I want to do a comic or something. I just, um, doing one alone is very time consuming and I have no help and I also work and things like that. So it, if I d ended up doing it, it, it would be very, 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 very long time in the works before I could actually do it. Um, if you had to choose one medium for the rest of your life, it would be, it would be graphite. Um, general thoughts, a general thoughts question, uh, what do you think about, about it since it's such a, oh yeah, I know what it is. Okay, huge topic in our community is realism necessary. Okay, as I sit here drawing my anthropomorphic characters, characters that don't necessarily, whatever, well obviously not necessarily, obviously do not exist in real life. You can see that I'm still using concepts of realism as I am doing it. I am plotting out my anatomy. I am adding muscle tone. I am adding uh, dimension. I am adding shapes, sizes, all sorts of things to my drawing. Yes, realism is a necessity because if you don't understand how things work in the real life, um, when you go to draw it, it's not going to translate because we as people look at something that is a creation, a cartoon or whatever, our only comparison to it is reality. So there has to be a root in reality. Um, uh, uh, an elbow can only bend in one direction, unless it's broken. Uh, fingers have got bones in them, so if you just have little, you know, uh, flaccid jelly fingers, it's not going to look very good. So yes, realism is highly important and it helps you grow as an artist to understand it. Um, I've known plenty of artists who have gone back and learned realism. They have studied their anatomy. They have studied plant life and things like that, gone in depth with drawing that sort of stuff. And it has only been beneficial. It makes their work seem that much more alive, really. So yeah, I fully agree that realism is necessary. Even right now, as I'm sitting here talking to you, I'm thinking about how, um, with my color, watercolor works, you know, I've gone back and I've started studying things like plants, how they look, um, how to how to portray them with inks and things like that, and it has done nothing but improve my art. It's just livened it, and it's given me, you know, kind of a new renewed purpose of, you know, hey, this is what I could be doing because I don't know what else to do. So yes, realism is important. I highly encourage you guys in your learning years to definitely study it. Um, especially if you have things like uh, real-life models at your disposal. You really, really need to put some time and effort into that stuff. I'm not saying that you need to draw um, perfect like bowls of fruit and things like that, but if you stop and think about it, think about the, you know, and I, I'll, I'll speak to you guys on the level that you understand or that you can relate to. Um, look at Miyazaki. I'm always going to go back to Miyazaki. Miyazaki's artwork is cartoony. It is clearly animated, but the details that he puts in his backgrounds, the details that he puts in his food, the way that the food sits in a bowl, or the way that it pulls apart when um, someone's eating it or whatever, all of that is a basis in reality. All of that was studied by him, his animators, whoever, and it makes that work just stand out. It, it's got a level of quality to it that you can feel as an artist and as a viewer. So yeah, I do encourage realism. I am, you guys really, I mean, I'm, I'm not going to tell anybody ever what to do, but I just say, you know, you could tell an artist who's put in their time versus someone who's just, um, uh, kind of in, you know, not insultingly, but being kind of lazy by not, um, taking the time to do the study. You know what I mean? 
And it's the same with anatomy. If you don't understand how the body works, your bodies are never going to look right. And the clothing that sits on them is never going to look right. It's always going to look a little bit off. Okay, so enough of that. Um, is getting professional art supplies necessary? Um, I'm a firm believer in two things. You are not limited by your art supplies. Ever. You will always find a way to make it work, whether you adjust your style, whether you learn how to manipulate the medium just right, um, whatever. You will find a way to make it work. But that being said, if you are a professional artist and you want to be taken seriously, then you really need to get professional art supplies. It's different when it's something like, okay, I'm sketching out a concept and all I have is my little yellow pencil. Big deal, no one's going to judge you that much for that. But if you're sitting there working on a full-on illustration and you're pulling out your uh, water-based Crayolas that you got for 59 cents at the store, um, they're probably going to look at you a little weird because they're paying for quality, which means you should be using quality materials as well. Um, I understand when people say, well, it's the artwork they should be buying and not the materials. That's true to a degree, but the materials are also part of the purchase. You guys should be factoring that into your commission prices. Um, higher quality materials means that the artwork is going to remain vibrant and it is going to look the way that it is intended to for a lot longer. If you get cheap art supplies and do professional, try to do professional work with it, um, and you end up with yellowed paper within like a couple weeks or your uh, watercolor ends up chalky and just smears all over the place afterwards it's really going to reflect on you as an artist so if you're going to portray yourself as a professional it is better to use professional grade materials now there are a lot of student grade materials and people forget that it's not dollar store stuff it's not professional it's right in between but it does work and it's not the most expensive, but it's not cheapest either. And people tend to reflect on it a little bit more positively than say Crayola or something. So short answer is if you want to be taken as a professional, yes, you need to be using professional quality materials. If you're not trying to pass yourself off as a professional and you're just kind of learning how to do um, a, a style or to um, uh uh, what am I um oh my goodness what am I, or just to practice um techniques and stuff like that then no you don't need the high quality stuff for that hmm. okay and he also asks if I'm an anus well I don't particularly like uh referring to myself as one I kind of you know think it's like okay but I understand what you mean by it what you're asking is am I a friend I am a friend forever and for always okay so the art of candace on youtube and she asked a question earlier i believe too asks um have you always drawn anthropomorphic questions when did you start drawing them and why so let's get a drink here mm. i have always wanted to draw anthropomorphic characters but um because i grew up on like the great mouse detective rescuers down under uh uh, 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 oh god, I'm thinking of it. <clears throat> Oliver and Company, things like that. You know, all those nice uh, um, animal Disney movies. So I always have kind of wanted to. I just haven't because um, I was teased a lot just for drawing people. I assumed that the second I started drawing animals, it would get even worse. Now, I did, as a kid, draw animals, and I do recall my grandma once or twice sort of pointing out that I wasn't drawing real animals and blah, 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 and that it looked ridiculous. So I think that that had a pretty big influence on it because I did look to my grandma a lot because she was, you know, the only other active artist in the family. Um, so because of that, I sort of, I kept drawing, but I, I definitely didn't show people. <clears throat> um... And then when I got the internet as a teenager, because, you know, I'm a little bit older than most of you, uh, I uh, discovered that there was like this negative connotation towards people who drew anthropomorphic characters, you know, furries and things like that. 
and I didn't want people just because they'd already written me off as so many things for drawing pretty girls well I didn't want to get written off as something else so I never drew anthropomorphic characters in high school or even in college it wasn't until just a couple years ago that I finally decided I didn't care about what people thought of me and I think that a lot of that stemmed from the confidence of going into nursing that I was taking my time to take care of other people and learning how to take care of other people so who cares what people think of me I am a good person and you know my art does not dictate who I am and a lot of people do that and that's fair warning to you guys you will be judged on your artwork people if you draw gruesome things people will think that you're a morbid gruesome person which isn't true people have made a ton of assumptions about me as a person based on what I've done with Cherry. It's like, no, I'm not actually like that. That's just how the character is, but they can't seem to separate the two. Um, point being though is uh, I was afraid, so I didn't do it. And I regret it to this day because I've nothing but enjoyed my time drawing anthropomorphic characters. And I'm wondering to myself, like, why didn't we do this, you know, years ago? Why did we let other people make us feel bad about something we hadn't even really done yet? But, you know, it was the whole stigma of I don't want to be associated with a group, which again is very ignorant on my part because this group, you know, furries, whatever you want to call them, have been nothing but nice to me. I'm not like quote unquote one of them but they don't expect me to be either and they've been nothing but supportive and kind and helpful to me so yeah there's it was through a lot of ignorance that I withheld drawing something that I wanted to do and I'm glad that I kind of woke up and got over it but yeah yep 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 all right so it actually started two years ago and it's just kind of been going on a roll since then but you guys have seen my artwork you know that i do more than just furry artwork um dancing turtles on youtube asks what my favorite sketchbook is i have answered that one what's your inspiration for art and i've answered that one so i'm going to move on to the next question maria 12 on youtube asks how do you find the time to draw this is an excellent question and it's one that i think that all artists need to ask themselves and sort of look inside and figure out at one point i was not finding time to draw at one point i was failing all of my classes i was unhappy i was miserable i was stressed and i was sad and then i was like you know something i need something to decompress with and drawing was a readily available uh means to do that because at you know once i stopped working for drawing for work and stuff like that I miss drawing a lot. Um, I had to take a break from it for a while because of work, or because of how work is. His, he's way too big compared to her. Ha ha ha. Again, poor planning. Um, and of course, my neighbor's dog's out now. Um, so, I had to ask myself what was more important: my sanity, or you know whatever else I had going on. So I made it to where I started making time to draw. Um, if it meant taking a break during lecture to doodle something just so I could keep paying attention for the rest of class, that's what I would do. Um, I started setting aside time in the morning before work to do a couple doodles and, you know, just scribble a bit. And I found that it really, really, really has helped. Um, so yeah, you have to make time to draw. You have to set that time aside. It's no different than setting time aside for yourself to eat a good meal or setting time aside for yourself to work out. You have to choose what's important in your life. And if drawing is important in your life, then you will make time to do it. It might mean going to bed a little bit later. It might mean waking up a little bit earlier at times, but it's a lot better than, you know, the frustration that comes with not drawing and then realizing that you're losing the skills that you haven't been using because that's exactly what ends up happening. If you don't use it, you lose it. So yes, that's how I find the time is I make the time. I don't, I don't let things, or I try not to let things get in the way of me uh, doing the things that I like to do, um, especially if I get so much enjoyment out of it as I do with artwork. Okay, so the next question that I have here is from Art for Fun on YouTube. What inspires you the most? Um, I have answered this. Other artists, movies, 
music, etc. I'm an artist, but um, since I've answered that, I'm not going to answer it again. But they do go on to make an excellent point: is I am an artist myself, and I often end up with a problem where I have too many good ideas, projects that I want to work on all at once. Does this ever happen to you? Yes, this happens to me all the time, and it is exactly why nothing ever gets done. My focus is never, um, it's it's not focused. My focus is too di divert, or, oh my goodness, what am I thinking? It's too spread out. Um, I'll want to work on all sorts of things and I'll try to barter with myself and say, okay, I'll work on this project for like 20 minutes. I'll work on this project for 20 minutes. And then I end up just watching YouTube or something because I can't get myself to focus enough to get started. So what I've actually ended up doing is setting aside projects or abandoning projects that, you know, they're, they're interesting, but they're not interesting enough or they're not developed enough. And I'm trying to stick with the stuff I have the most developed um, in order to keep moving forward. But even within that, like if you look at Piper, Piper story and everything like that, I'm divulging into two different directions with that because I have that storybook style and then I have um, the anthropomorphic style. Now clearly I am more uh, practiced in my anthropomorphic style uh, with them having human bodies and everything, but um, at the same time, uh, I really enjoy my, my storybook style. So I, even within that limited window of what to work on, I make it so much harder because I spread my styles out and things like that. So yes, I am very guilty of that and I feel like a lot of artists are. And it's why um, artists tend to need managers or they need to have people in their life who can manage them and help control them and keep them. Because we as creative people just go off and it makes sense in our mind and it is a beautiful thing in our mind like my entire story and everything from beginning to end is done in my mind but to actually put it on paper to share with you guys it's like yeah oh my goodness it's the same with paintings it's like i'll be working on a painting i'll be like oh i had this really good idea and i'll be sketching it out and then i'll be like but i have to finish this painting first and there's times where i end up not coming back to stuff because i just get way too pulled into something else it's it's a curse so the short answer is yes, <laughs> that happens to me all the time. Um, Fanock over on Instagram asks, how should one go about drawing anthropomorphic animals? I kind of want to, but I am not sure how. Um, anthropomorphism is a funny mixture between humans and animals, and it's varying degrees of mixtures between humans and animals. Um, you can sort of do research on this and find the differences, but what you'll find most often is that people kind of fall into two categories. It's either human bodies with animalistic qualities or animal bodies with humanistic qualities like uh, rescuers down under where there are mice bodies and mice size and everything like that, but they have human qualities like they have a organized government um, and they have uh, the ability to talk and things like that. So the first thing I would always suggest is figure out which one appeals to you the most because it's probably the one you're going to develop the most. I went with humanoidish bodies with animalistic qualities. They're still mice. Um, Piper is still a mouse, but you know, if it weren't for the ears and the nose, she would look in the tail, she would look human. But I went with that because it's what I understood. It's what I knew and it's what I was comfortable with. So it's what I developed. Um, that's not to say it can't change later on. Obviously, as you guys have seen with my recent developments, it can change and it does change. Art is always growing, changing, morphing. It's an expression and expressions can't be bottled into one little box. Da -da -da -da. Mm. But yes, there's that. So next question. Superstar Nia on YouTube asks, how do you do your poses or come up with them? Well, as I sit here struggling, trying to figure out what I want to draw. Um, my poses, I initially, I just, I try to, I usually go into a sketch with an idea of what I want to do. And if I don't have an idea of what I want to do, then um, what I do is I kind of look for inspiration. Um, I'll look for poses online. I'll look for... Um, I'll look for, uh, oh, what am I trying to think? Um, references. There we go. <laughs> a lot of it is that, um, yeah, 
that's basically it as far as poses go. Uh, I, I'm still pretty bad at gesturing out completely and things like that and it leads to some kind of wonky anatomy and things like that. But when I say look up references and things like that, just keep in mind I'm not saying trace. A lot of people, they, they think, they put words in my mouth or they put words in my ideas. Um, do not trace. That's wrong. Tracing, I mean, people are like, oh, it's a learning tool. Well, yeah, maybe to a degree if you're five, but if you're 27, don't be tracing because that's rude. Um, and when I say look for references, I mean, there's lots of free images out there, free stock images and things like that, that people have given you permission to go ahead and use, um, that you don't have to worry about uh, getting in trouble for using. Um, but, you know, it is always polite to... Uh, reference them to cite them to be sure that you you know give them the uh, reference um, shooter whatever creator uh, credit for what they've done because they put in the work and you're borrowing from it that's the polite thing to do but I understand that it doesn't always happen and a lot of people from my experience it hasn't been the end of the world if you don't do it um, they usually just say hey you know this looks a lot like mine and then you know if you just fess up and say oh yeah I did I forgot to cite I'll go do it right now they're cool with it but if you're gonna be a little turd about it and say uh, I have never seen that in my life and they can do an overlay and it matches up exactly then yeah you you need to be um, rethinking yourself there um, what else is there well yeah, so references, and there's nothing wrong with references, I want to toss it out there. References have kind of been demonized because of the whole quote-unquote art theft community getting a little bit too crazy with what they consider art theft. You cannot copyright a pose. It is not possible. Even Captain Morgan poses. That's not a copyrighted thing. The character is copywritten, the artwork in the picture is copywritten, but you cannot copyright the pose. I can draw a Captain Morgan pose and I will not get in trouble, I will not get sued, I will not get anything because they can't do that. It's a pose. It's a position that a body is put in that is natural to life and yeah, yeah, you just, you can't do it. Um, so yeah, there's that. So because of that, people have been afraid to look up references and things like that and it's sort of been demonized. Well. I need references still. I don't understand what all characters look like all the time, so I have to look up pictures all the time. Like when I'm drawing Basil, I always have to look him up because, oh my god, how did they do his nose? It's so huge. So, yeah, there's nothing wrong with using references, so just tossing that out there. Um, Nancy Art 94 on Instagram asks, what made me start drawing? I've explained this a couple times, but basically I used to sit down, um, I, I was a rambunctious kid and I twisted my ankle one year so I was in a cast and my grandma was looking after me so I had to sit down when she was doing her Bob Ross hour and I sat there and watched Bob Ross and I would get bored with my coloring books and stuff like that so I eventually just kind of um, went into drawing and things like that I don't even know what She's, <laughs> I don't even know what I'm doing here. All right, so on to the next thing. Good advice, or what advice for graduated students? Okay, here we go. My advice for you guys is stop putting anime in your portfolios, period. We are not a country based on anime. We are not a country based on manga. If you're good at it, okay, cool, that's fine. But don't put it in your portfolios. Oh my God. Um, I made that mistake several times and finally and most people like wouldn't even give me the time of day finally one nice gentleman stopped me and said this is why nobody is taking your portfolio seriously and despite the fact it was professional looking work despite the fact that it was very well done very well thought out that the mediums were that i used were used correctly it was beautiful work it was illustrative it was the typographical hierarchy and everything that had to go along with it was beautiful fantastic that it got good grades in school it is not what uh, professional artists look for ever. It's good that you can do that stuff. There's nothing wrong with doing that stuff. And I'm going to throw that out there too. But if you're looking for a job, don't put that stuff in there. Because they will not take you seriously. Even if it's, oh, well, I'm going to be the next manga ka. It's like, well, uh, chances are you won't. And you're kind of shooting yourself in the foot because your clientele are looking at you. And they're considering you to be a... Uh, stagnant artist 
and things like that. But further on with that point, um, vary your art. If you're going in for a graphic design logo job and all you take in are illustrations, they're going to kick you out the door. If you go in for an illustrative position and all you take in are logos, they're going to kick you out the door. Make sure you tailor your portfolio to the job you're trying to get, um, which means you should have a plethora to pull from. You guys should still, even after graduation, be creating, working, developing, whatever. Um, that's That was another big one that I struggled with. And again, find somebody who knows what they're doing. They'll help you with your portfolio. Um, there are, te you know, your teachers really should be helping you with uh, your portfolios and stuff like that. But um, I understand that not all teachers, you know, have time to do that with all their students. But if you are putting forth an actual effort, then they should be willing to help you. Um, I'm trying to think of what else. Learn interview skills. Don't just, because a lot of artists go into their interviews and they tightly fold their hands like this and they kind of pull themselves down inwards and they sort of curl up a little bit because artists tend to be very non-social and they speak like this and they say, well, um, I went to such and such art school and um, I uh, majored in uh, this, that, and um, the other thing, and as you can see by my portfolio, um, it's, um, yeah, I really, really, really like doing this, and I really, really like doing this. So, that's, and, you know, I've sat in on interviews like that, um, and that's a terrible thing, because now they're doing group interviewing, so it's even more pressure. Learn to speak, learn to lift your head up, learn to look at your interviewer, learn to talk directly to them, make eye contact, smile, project yourself. You are a product. And I hate saying that because I don't feel like we should ever have to sell ourselves, but they're hiring you just as much as they're hiring your talent. If especially if it's like a studio or if it's um an in-house sort of place to be. Um there's very few of those around here. That's why I'm like, oh, should, does that even count? But I keep forgetting that where I live is different. Um, if it's in-house, you have to be able to get along with people. You have to smile. You have to laugh. You have to be able to communicate. You can't just curl up in your little art corner and do your little drawings and think that they're going to pay you hundreds of millions of dollars to do that. That is not how it's going to work. Some of the best animators I know are animated themselves highly boisterous, very expressive, they talk with their hands, they get in your face, they tell you all sorts of stories because they are projecting exactly what it is they're able to put on paper. So yeah, there's that. Um, and make sure that you have a sort of a mix in your portfolios when you go to interview of both digital and uh, traditional mediums and make it clear that you understand that it may have to go either way and that you know how to process your artwork and scan it in, make it look nice regardless of whether it's professional or traditional because very few people are asking for tradi they're asking for traditional looking pieces or even traditional pieces, but you're still going to end up scanning them. And so you have to know how to do that stuff too. Um, but yeah, it, it, it's not just about your talent. It's also about what you're willing to, what you're willing to bring to the table as far as, um, uh, ability goes because you know if they if you can draw like illustrations and stuff like that but you don't know how to put it into a pdf format or a printable format uh for a uh for print then yeah they're going to be like well then why are we hiring you for that that's something you should know how to do um okay so what made you interested in becoming a nurse this, again, is another interesting story about me, so we'll get right into it. Um, I've always wanted to help people. Even in my high school days when I was getting bullied, I wanted to help people. But the art program was a big slacker program in my um, school, or was treated like a big slacker program. So all of the popular kids went in there just to get the easy grade and things like that. So. And we also had a lot of favoritism among the teaching staff for those particular people. So when it came down to things like um, helping, there, like in particular, there was one uh, instance in particular I remember. I really was trying to get involved and really trying to help 
was a project called Empty Bowls where we would make clay bowls to fill up with soup and stuff like that and all the proceeds went to helping the homeless. Well, I was trying to get involved in it and everything like that. I asked, you know, what, what do you guys need? You know, I'm here, I, I'm willing to make bowls, I'm willing to sell the bowls and the soup and do all sorts of things. Um, I had a couple of the girls and a couple of the girls who were put in charge were popular girls who didn't necessarily like me very much for whatever reason. Um, so I went to help and they basically turned me away, told me to go home and said, we don't want your help, we don't need your help and nobody wants you here. And we're talking, I had spent hours making bowls, I had spent hours, you know, trying to help, you know, doing whatever I could, even if it meant setting up tables and things like that, I was there trying to help. And from that point on, I just kind of felt like I wasn't good enough to help people that I um, was made to feel, even with my art and things like that, I wasn't good enough. And that translated into me deciding I didn't want to go into nursing as a kid. Even though I thought it was a really cool idea and I wanted to save the world and everything, um, I was very dissuaded from it in that moment and it kind of, I, I don't want to say it traumatized me, but it definitely um, had an effect on me that I wish it hadn't because that feeling never went away of wanting to do it. I was just, I became very afraid to do it. So um, when I became an adult and realized, you know, the world sucks, people suck, everyone sucks, I'm going to do what I'm going to do and I'm going to do what I feel is right and decided to go into nursing. I had already been a professional artist. I had already been in contact with more community. I was very aware of the things around me and it clicked and it's like, you know something, I'm not afraid anymore. We're going to do this. And going back to school at my age at that point was very terrifying because I was with kids. but. At the same time, it's like, you know something, it doesn't matter because this is what I should have done to begin with. This is what I need to be doing now. I am called to do both art and um, nursing. So I eventually got there, but yeah, um, I've always wanted to kind of be a nurse. I just chose to do something that made me feel comfortable and happy and that no one told me I couldn't do or sent me away from, you know, I went with that instead of the other thing. Sad story, but it is life and I wouldn't want it any other way because I learned so much about people from that. I learned so much from that negative experience about myself and about other people that I, you know, as, as much as it hurt, I'm glad it hurt because I, I was stronger for it. It's ridiculous to say it that way and I know some people are like, that's stupid, why would you ever let someone do that to you? It's like, well, when you're a kid, it's a different, it's a different situation, but I grew from it, so no regrets absolutely no regrets. Um, Mockingjay on YouTube asks, do you still have some of your sketchbooks from when you're from your teen years and would you ever do a video of them? I do have them. I keep a couple of them around to kind of remind myself of where I was and where I am now um, to see my progress and growth. I'm not sure that I would ever share them but uh, maybe one day if there's enough interest I'll, I'll go ahead and do it. This sketch isn't turning out. I'm just gonna abandon it. So yeah, maybe one day. And I think we're to our last question anyway. Wizzo Real Art on YouTube asks, what would you do if your channel is popu uh, got popular, I assume, and got a million subscribers? Wow, um, I won't kid myself into thinking that's ever, ever going to happen. Um, I just am here to have fun. Subscribers are important to me. Every single one of you guys is important to me, but I'm not collecting you and it's not a competition for me. I am sharing myself with you guys and if you're interested in that, awesome. I'm glad you're here with me for this journey. Um, but there's not a number that I want to reach. There's not anything special about it to me. Um, I would be happy to be that popular and I would be grateful to be that popular. But it's not my goal. My goal is to just keep doing what I'm doing and to share with you guys and hopefully to cheer you guys up or help you out in some way or some fashion. It's not a competition to me. YouTube is not my income. YouTube is not my job. It's just a platform that I use to share, express, and make friends. And you know, 1 million subscribers does not mean one or 100 million subscribers does not mean 100 million friends. Um, so I just try to keep that in mind. It's like, you know, it's not indicative 
of the quality of people versus whatever. Um, but if I ever did get popular like that, again, I would be grateful, but I would still keep doing exactly what I am doing now. Trying to talk to you guys as a person, trying to provide content to teach you guys and to help you along with your art journeys, to encourage you and things like that. That's all I've ever wanted to do. Um, they also ask, can you draw an airplane? Yeah, I probably could if I sat down and actually did it. Um, if you didn't draw, what would you do? Well. I'm actually uh, kind of, when I did stop drawing so much, um, what ended up happening is I took up sports. Um, this was uh, my post-college years when I was working for my art and I didn't want to come home and do art. I picked up running. So I imagine that if I had to stop drawing for whatever reason, it would just translate into another form of expression and I would just start drawing. Or not drawing, but I would start running um, again. I'm trying to start running just for health reasons right now, but um, yeah, I tend to fall back to sporty things when I don't have the ability to draw or if I need to take a break. It's not very often, and my recent gainage of 40 pounds proves it, but <laughs> yeah, um, that's exactly what I would probably do is I would just pick up run competitive running again because it's a lot of fun and it's actually a very good environment to be in. Um, what paper do I like? I've sort of explained that already a couple times so I'm not going to answer it again. And can you do giveaways? Well, I have done giveaways. Um, if you look at my channel, there's a few instances where I've done some giveaways. I am planning a large giveaway for my 10,000 subscriber. Um, yeah, yeah, I don't care about numbers, but then I do that. I'm doing that just as a celebration, as a thank you to you guys. Um, I don't expect to get to 10,000 anytime soon. I'm just, you know, if I get there, all right, let's do something to celebrate because there's nothing wrong with celebrations. Um, but yes, I do do giveaways. I am planning giveaways for the future. I am going into the means to be able to do more uh, sort of quality giveaways and things like that. So I'm, and I enjoy them. I really like, you know, making people happy and uh, giving back to them a little bit of for their support and things like that. Um, so yeah, giveaways are something I do a lot. Probably more like even this is like, I didn't have to do, a, I mean, what milestone is 6,000, but at the same time, it's like uh, 6,000 people, you know? That's still nothing to bat an eyelash at. I mean, every day it's like I'm amazed at how many followers or subscribers I have. So, I mean, every day is just a reminder of how awesome YouTube is. But um, at the same time, it's like I don't feel like... I don't know. When it comes to giveaways and stuff like that, I try to leave it for the milestones. Like, the big numbers like 10,000, 100, 1,000, 5,000. Um, I did one at 5,000 and I did one at 100 because those are just kind of like those first few milestones. My next one will be at 10,000. I'll probably do another one at, and from there just go by tens to um, 20,000, 30,000, 40,000, 50,000, stuff like that. So yes, there are giveaways in the future and I am good for it. Everybody I've ever done a giveaway or who has won a giveaway prize from me has gotten their prizes. So yeah. I'm not one of those YouTubers who says, I'm going to do a giveaway, and then never does the giveaway. <laughs> and I always send out the prizes, too. And I hope that everyone likes them. So far, everyone has acted like they like them, so it's good. But all right, that's it for my questions. I am all out. Um, but again, I just kind of want to thank you guys for joining me for this very long video of me answering questions and doodling. Um, I was very happy to do it. You know, I, I know I say a million times it's not about the numbers. I do like that my numbers are lower and that I can still talk to you guys individually and when I live stream and stuff like that, that it's not, there's not so many people that I miss things that people say all the time. So, I mean, I'm still happy that my numbers are low but not low, if that makes any sense. It's a comfortable level that I am at right now. Um, and should I someday maybe possibly get more popular, then, you know, cool. I'm grateful for that too. I am grateful for all support regardless of the number. So, cause you know, I have 6,000 subscribers, but I probably only hear from about, you know, 10 of you, 10 to 15 of you at a time. 
So, I mean, and not everyone has time, or not everyone even speaks English, so that is what it is. I'm not dissing on that either. I'm just saying that um, I appreciate everybody. I love everybody's input. I love everybody's support and everything, and I'm just grateful. Um, this could have gone a completely different way for me, and it didn't. Um, 6,000 is a big number. 6,000 is a number I never expected to see this soon. I expected this number maybe after a few years, you know, of um, just consistent uploads. And to have it so soon is just really humbling. So, yeah. Super happy. And I love all of you guys. And I just want to thank you guys all the time endlessly for coming and watching my videos and giving me your input and telling me that you enjoy my stuff because that's what sometimes is what I need to keep going. Um, there's times where it's really, really difficult for me to even want to draw. It's not an easy thing to do when you feel like nobody cares, but everyone has been, again, just amazing. And I can't express enough how my gratitude for it. So, yeah, thank you guys so much a bajillion times. I'm going to keep saying thank you, but I'm not going to cry, I promise. Um, but yes, so that's going to be it for this video. Um, uh, I, it, the questions I got were very interesting, and um, some of them were very in-depth. But I want you guys to understand that the answers are opinion. Nothing I say is 100% the way it's always going to be or always should be. Um, you guys are individuals. You guys are all smart. You guys are all wonderful. You guys are all talented. So, you know, I might say things like, you know, don't put this in your portfolio or don't put that in your portfolio. But I'm only coming from a professional side when I say that. You know, you guys are free to do the artwork you want to do. And I encourage you to do the things that make you happy when it comes to your artwork because that's how you're going to continue doing it. But should you choose to take a more professional approach to it, that is how I approach answering those kinds of questions. Um, it's just, you know, I've had world experience versus just me drawing in my uh, office all day long. So yes, that's where that comes from. Don't don't take it as an insult. Obviously, I don't mean it. I'm just trying to help you guys out the best I know how. And that's just by telling you what I know through my experiences. But yes, other than that, you know, thank you guys for watching. I hope you enjoyed watching my doodles. I'm going to do a real quick uh, uh, flip through here. Um, I was kind of trying, trying to draw him pulling her up. But it, she's far too calm for that. A little cute cuddle. Them, them kissing. Uh, on this page him kissing her cheek she's just kind of looking down at him here just their chibis and since I said that I have filmed this a couple times and my camera was messing up there's actually quite a lot of doodles because I had to keep coming up with new material because I had to start over so here's another kissing of them uh, them just kind of looking at each other then there's just a Lysrain Lysrain sort of being coy and Piper being a little bit desperate looking um, a Piper up there um, them just sort of holding on to each other's hands here, uh, another chibi version of them here, and then him just kind of snuggling up to the side of her face up here. So yeah, that's actually, this has been the culmination of all the doodles that I've had to do for them because of the video. Um, but you guys will see these again in the sketchbook review. But again, thank you guys so much for everything. Thank you so much for all the support. Um, Hooray, 6,000 subscribers. I'm so excited and um, I'm just excited to see what the future holds, um, whether it be 10,000, a million, whatever. Um, I'm just excited to be on this journey and uh, to be growing as much and as quickly as I am. Um, it's been nothing but humbling and fantastic and you guys are all awesome and talented and i just love all of you too so keep drawing guys that's all i can say keep drawing keep your heads up and you know you'll get there eventually as far as your goals for art and things like that um eventually you will draw that perfect figure eventually you will be able to do the watercolors the way that you want to do the watercolors it is a never-ending journey and i'm glad to be on it with so many awesome people so thanks for watching. Um, if you're not already subscribed, go ahead and subscribe below. Uh, and thank you guys so much for all of the questions. It was fun answering them and I'll see you in the next video.